All right, I think we're gonna get underway. First of all, I wanna thank all of you. This is quite a wonderful crowd for joining us for our discussions with Mercy leaders. Today, the topic is um, one that's on all of our minds, pretty much 24 seven, navigating your finances. We're gonna talk about everything from taxes and other um, aspects of this COVID pandemic that have affected individuals to the world and how it affects countries and how we interact with one another. We are joined by Denise Stefano, who is a CPA and professor and chair of our accounting program. Oh, good, you wave, thank you. And Victor Patenkamani is with us. He is an MBA and professor and associate dean in our School of Business. Did you wave, Victor? Just wave a little bit, there you are, okay. Um, and so we'll just jump right in. Like, like, like I want, I have a, just a big, sort of opening salvo question for both of you, which is this pandemic has just screwed around with our lives in so many ways, physically, emotionally, and of course, financially. I wanna ask both of you what you've been thinking about as you've watched all this unfold. Denise, I'll just start with you. Sure, Edie, thanks. Well, you know, firstly, many people have lost their jobs, right? Um, there's some real desperation out there for, for many people. Last week, the stats showed that we were up to 26 million people having filed for employment, unemployment benefits, and that, to me, is just staggering. Um, this has placed many Americans in financial distress, especially those who work paycheck to paycheck. People are just struggling to meet the bare necessities, put food on the table, pay their rent, pay their utilities. And it doesn't help that pe many people have had difficulty in their states filing for unemployment benefits and the delays they've experienced. It took a while to get some of the stimulus checks out as well. But by now, most folks should have received the stimulus monies if they're receiving a direct deposit. If not, and they're waiting for a check. They could might still be waiting, but you know that should be um, they should receive that fairly soon. Um, you know, we can see that people are not dealing with this well. Many want to get back to work in order to sustain their daily living, feed their kids, whatever, you know, they need to be doing. Um, and people are really starting to, you know, protest the, the shelter-in requirements. Um, some are, it's having some severe health effects on people, which throws in another difficult financial aspect that people are being forced to deal with, um, health benefits, being able to pay for those health benefits. It's really something we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Like I said before, some real desperation out there. So before I, want to, before I want to follow up on something and then I'm going to get to Victor, you said most of us should have received the stimulus checks by now. Mm -hmm. How do we know if we're getting them direct deposited or sent to us? And is it going to everybody or are there some people who don't get them? Well, if, if you, well, first of all, the, the stimulus checks are being, um, uh, uh, the, the way the IRS is actually tracking this is by your filing of your 2018 or 2019 tax, re tax returns. If you haven't filed your 2019 tax returns, we know there's been, you know, a reprieve given an extension on filing the tax returns and they'll go back to your 2018 tax returns um, to uh, determine your eligibility. Um, uh, you know, just talking about eligibility a little bit. Um, if you're a single uh, individual filing single um, up to 75 and you're making less than $75,000, you'll get the full $1,200, uh, you know, check for your stimulus. If you're married and, you know, it doubles that to $150,000, you'll get $2,400, uh, still not a significant amount of money, obviously. Um, and again, they, they tie it to, to, you know, the filing of your tax returns. If you're getting Social Security benefits and you haven't filed a tax return for some reason, then they track it through your Social Security benefits. And so um, there's a few who won't get a stimulus check. This is something that you recommended to me that I look at. Yeah. Children who are 17 or 18, college students between the ages of 19 and 23. That's an odd little distinction, but okay. Well, I think oh, I guess it's college students versus non-college students, right? Yeah, I think that's because a lot of college students are being claimed as dependents on their parents' tax returns. So if you're being claimed as a, as a dependent on someone else's tax return, you will not receive the stimulus checks. They've actually said that, you know, the college students within that age bracket are probably the ones that are going to get hurt most because they are being claimed as dependents. Um, and because they're older than 17, the parents aren't getting the dependent money either, the $500 of dependent money. So uh, that pool of, um, of, of individuals is, is getting, you know, somewhat hurt by this, this whole, you know, this whole CARES Act. And if you haven't filed in 2019 or 2018, you're not getting a check. 
No, no. I mean, there's some rare exceptions. Um, there is, um, uh, you know, a link on the IRS's website where you can, you know, try and file for the stimulus. But that's really basically how they're they're tracking it. So, uh, yeah, the, the likelihood is 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 nil. Okay, um, Victor, um, how do you? What have you been thinking about? And in particular, sort of how nations are dealing with other nations right now. Yeah, I mean, my first thought really was for our students, right? I, I think, you know, these are young people and they have never experienced something like this. I mean, I have experienced many of these type of crises. I've, uh, I've experienced 9-11, I've experienced the, the dot-com bubble, I've experienced the 2008 financial crisis. I've, I myself read a lot about American history with uh, uh, the uh, Great uh, Depression. So I think, you know, this was a bit far removed from many to really understand. I understood very quickly that this was going to be very, very impactful. Um, and, and, and that, uh, you know, our young people obviously uh, were going to be very distraught. But you know, this is a learning experience. I think there's no other way but to deal with this. And how do you deal with it? It's really, one, you tighten your belt from a cash flow standpoint. You know, you cut a lot of your spending. It's all about cash flow at this point, right? It's, it's really all about survival at this point. Uh, all the unnecessities, if you don't have to spend, just just cut, 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 cut. And, and then find all the resources uh, that are out there, even for food. There's a lot of food bank out there. You know, reach out to the food banks, and and this is this is a tough time, but it's not going to last, right? So that's really on, on from a, from an individual standpoint. Uh, what do you do really right now? Right. It's all about m ensuring that the the well-being of your family and and of and, and your cash flow. Uh, and and if you have to negotiate with uh, with your landlord, with your with other vendors, take the step. Just don't wait. You know, reach out and explain the situation. You know, be proactive about it. Um, and there, there are community hubs out there also. So it's really up to to us individually if we want to take care of ourselves. So from a, from a global standpoint, I've been, uh, you know, uh, this is this is again very very challenging. And from a U.S. perspective, I'm not worried about the U.S. I think this is a very rich country. Uh, uh, we have a lot of resources. We we can take care of ourselves. I think, I think, unfortunately, the government has been very, very slow. The government has not done a very good job, uh, even though with all the resources that we have, uh, this crisis should not have become of this magnitude. Uh, I, think, I think the country is just very wealthy and, and very capable of taking care of these type of issues. Uh, other countries are not, right? Um, other countries... And, 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 and to be honest, I'm looking at the, the fatality rate, the fatality rate in the United States. Yes, the number, the nominal number are very high. But when you look at the percentage, it, the fat we have, we're talking about a fatality rate of maybe 6%. But look at the fatality rate in, in Europe, right? In, in uh, Italy, France, uh, the UK, right? That really raised the question of, hey, what type of healthcare system do we want? Do you really want a socialized healthcare system? Because that's what we have in the UK and that's what we have in, the, in, in France. And we are seeing that some of this healthcare system have been completely overwhelmed. So I think this conversation is very, very important for us. We, we, you know, we are talking about a crisis now, but we have to really look forward and understanding about how, what type of system do we have and what type of system do we want? Um, Could I just um, follow sure. up on something that, that Victor was talking about with regard to the federal government being slow and, mm -hmm. you know, really uh, reacting to this, not even just that, but from a financial aspect, you know, the, the, the objective of the CARES Act was to get money out into the marketplace and the economy to help start jumpstart our economy. We aren't even near there. Right. The, the, the money that's been put in people's pockets is just enough money and for some not even enough money 
just to meet the bare necessities. Forget about going out and having any kind of discretionary spending, like buying a car, unless you absolutely need it, obviously, but where are you going to go, right? So, but, you know, buying a car, buying a house, you know, the things that we really, when we look at our economy and the, and, and the way our economy is, 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 you know, progressing, we look at those types of things, that discretionary spending, not buying the bare necessities like food and, and things like that. The money that the federal government gave is really just giving, you know, to, to people to just, you know, acquire the bare necessities, forget about those extras. Day so I just day. wanted to add that to, you know, Victor's point before about the federal government and their, their involvement in this and being slow to actually react and things of that sort. So do either of you have any thoughts about the calculation of when to open up the economy versus um, ensuring health and safety? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a health expert. I, I think I will rather have a health expert really tell us what to do. I think, I, think, uh, I mean, I, I'm reading a lot, right? Right now, there is a lot of hopeful uh, uh, indication that maybe we are going to have a vaccine uh, by the beginning of fall, right? So there is, I think, a, a lab in, in Oxford that is actually going on testing some of these vaccines by September. So I think there are some hopeful, uh, uh, because again, if we don't deal with the healthcare side of the crisis, the economy is not going to recover. People are not going to be, do you really want to send your kids to school in this environment when you really don't know how many people are tested, right? Is that uncertainty that even if the government say, you know what, we are opening up, I, you really family, you, we are responsible for our kids. Are we going to put our kids out there in danger? So, but do you think, I mean, do you, can you possibly, I, to, to, to me, it feels like there's, people are getting a little twitchy out there now to get out. And, and, and that may be just anecdotal, <laughs> but um, can you foresee a world where we don't open up the economy till September? You know, Edie, I, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that's going to be very, very difficult. I mean, for the economy to be sh look, look at the, 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 the effect of it in just what a month and a half. We, we sheltered in what the, the middle of March. We're at the end of April right now. Look at the effect of it in just a month and a half. If we had to shelter in completely and not have the economy at least semi-operating you know, into somewhere in the fall. I, 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 I can't imagine, you know, the, the impacts of this. Um, there's got to be a happy medium, you know, between, you know, this slow progress and getting us back to some, some, some type of norm. I don't think we're going to be back to normal, uh, so to speak, in, in quite some time. I was just reading an article this morning, you know, we know that Georgia was one of those progressive states that's opening up and, yep. you know, of all, of, of all businesses to operate, you know, uh, professional services, you know, barbershops and, you know, you're touching people and, and, and closely contacting and things. And even the article even said, even though that that's the case, there's an eerie, eerie, eerie sound in Georgia. I think people are still afraid, even though they're saying, yeah, let's open up this economy. People are being extra cautious, um, you know, from, from a health consideration. And I, I think that even if we said, hey, let's open up the economy in full and turn the faucet on tomorrow, I still think you're going to have many people who are just going to really look at this very cautiously. And it's just going to take time to get things back to some type of normal state. Yeah, you know, my son tells me the tattoo parlors have opened up in Colorado for yeah. all of you who are keeping yeah. score. Um, so let me ask you some personal finance questions, Denise, because we've gotten questions, um, several questions along this line. Do the COVID stimulus checks need to be repaid? No, they do not. They, it, what the COVID stimulus checks really are, just so you understand, they're really a tax credit against your, a dollar for dollar tax credit against your 2020 tax return. But basically what the government done is advance those monies to folks. So it's, it's kind of, a, for people who get the stimulus check, it's kind of like a wash. But let's say for instance that, um, and I'll just, you know, I'm just gonna detract just a little bit, Edie, but on the same lines here, let's assume that um, you, didn't, uh, you, know, you didn't qualify under the income requirements uh, for COVID right now, but in 2020 you did you'll still have the opportunity to claim for that credit on your 2020 tax return. 
So if you okay. lost your job, let's say in early 2020, and your earnings went down to such a state that you would qu otherwise qualify for the COVID-19 stimulus, you will be able to um, to claim it as, as a credit on your 2020 tax return. Now, if you owe money, if you filed your taxes and you owe money, can you delay paying on that money until that July 15th deadline? Yes. Not only have the tax return to both federal and New York state, um, you know, I'm not familiar with all the other states, but New York state, they've extended their deadlines for filing the tax return to July 15th and any payments that you might owe with the tax return are also um, deferred to uh, July, July 15th. I'm sorry, not, not the 19th, 15th. Um, and if you owe estimated taxes, and this is just for the federal government right now, for your estimated tax payments, your first quarter and second quarter payments, which would normally be due on April 15th and June 15th, those are also getting extension to July 15th. For the state, the April 15th payment has gotten extended to July 15th. And while I usually follow suit with the, with the IRS, I, I'm not quite sure yet that they've extended the June 15th payment, but they usually follow, you know, behind what the IRS does. So I'm, I, I can't make any promises. I would assume that that's going to be forthcoming. Uh, but again, to, you know, uh, the tax return and any payment on the tax return, July 15th, first and second quarter payments, federal, July 15th, um, state, first quarter, July 15th, possibly the, the second quarter payment as well. I want to put in a little plug for our students who, under your guidance, offer free tax prep for people in the Westchester community yes. at tax time, will, will they, will, if, 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 if we are able to assemble someplace, will they be offering that whenever that time comes? Well, it's funny because I was just, um, you know, I communicate with the IRS regularly with regard to the VITA program. And, you know, it, it really depends on the site. Um, you know, we had um, sites both in our Dobbs Ferry and our Bronx campuses and our campuses are closed. So um, it's difficult to, if we're not open to be operating VITA, um, but other VITA sites within the county may have sites that are open, you know, depending on what the, the guidelines are from the governor and, and state requirements and things like that. So there, are, there is opportunity even if our students felt comfortable working in another VITA site, if they're certified, they could do that. Um, it's unfortunate that we had to wind down the program uh, as early as we did because we were doing very well in the program and it's very, very helpful to these low-income households who were right. really helped by this whole stimulus piece. All right, one more, uh, and then we'll come back to this, but what guidance can you share if you've been laid off as the result of this pandemic to handle your debt obligations? Um, so if you've been laid off, well, let's... Um, Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so the first thing to do if you've been laid off um, is you should be filing for unemployment as soon as possible because there have been some delays, although the state seems to really have gotten itself together and there's not that much of a delay anymore. Um, you know, so make sure you're processing that, uh, that un unemployment, uh, you know, that unemployment check. Um, under the CARES Act, the federal government automatically ties their federal unemployment to your, the filing of your state unemployment. So you'll get that additional $600 from the federal government as well, too. Um, and once you have the unemployment um, situation in order um, and you have, you know, maybe streamlined some of your, your, your income coming in, um, then you have things like credit card debt, maybe car loans. Say, Visa's not giving debt. you a break, are they? Sorry? Visa's not giving anybody a break, are they? Well, no, that's, that's not true. I mean, the, what I was going to say here is that once you, you, once you get the unemployment you know, piece in order and you have some income coming in at least, um, a lot of the um, uh, creditors are allowing their customers to restructure their finances, giving them some uh, deferrals on their payments. That doesn't mean that you don't have to pay. Um, it just means that if you are in dire straits and, and in financial distress, that many of the creditors are understand what's going on and are allowing their customers to defer maybe their mortgage payments, their car loan payments, their credit card payments. So it's always good to contact your creditor, um, uh, whoever that may be, uh, whoever you have your credit card through, whatever bank, um, and and talk to them, uh, you know, about trying to you know to uh, you know give you some um, you know relief at this point in time. But again, I, I, it's, it's not like you're going to be completely relieved from the debt. You are going to have to pay it. But at least if you got a couple of months reprieve to actually pay back that debt, that could be helpful. So I, I always recommend that that's after you get your finances in order with unemployment, that's the next thing you should be doing if you have 
you know, uh, bills and things out there that you can't pay. Um, and a lot of the creditors are being very understanding with that. Right. Um, Victor, there's been a lot written about this pandemic kind of pushing us all into an era of nationalism where every country is going to try to take care of itself to the exclusion of other countries. Um, are we in danger of that? Do you see that? Absolutely. Uh, if, even before the pandemic, right, we, there was a rise of nationalism already. You were seeing that in Europe uh, and, and you were seeing that here, here, here already in, in America. As, as, as you, you, you can see, uh, America has kind of stepped back from globalization a little bit. We, we, we move away from the climate change accord. So I think there was already a trend there. And this crisis, obviously, naturally, people are going to be uh, more looking more inward and try to protect themselves. I think that would be a mistake. I think our leaders actually should be courageous and actually not do that, because more and more we are very, very set, we are actually interdependent, right? The virus actually shows that you can actually not close the border. You are going to be affected. Uh, even the supply chain, the global supply chain is such that uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we don't manufacture everything here in the United States anymore. We are very dependent on different countries around the world uh, for our, even for our bare necessities. Uh, so I, I think th there is a risk, but I think we have to refrain from it. Can I ask you about the global supply chain? Because I've, I've heard a lot about it. But when I go to the store, I see stuff on the shelves. I, 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 I don't... I don't see people feeling the effects of that just yet, or am I misinformed about that? I mean, they, they are, you know, in, 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 the, in the, again, this is where being a wealthy country and having a dollar is so important, right? right? The, the U.S. dollar is a very, very powerful country, uh, currency. And, and right now it's very, very strong. So, we can still buy a lot of things, uh, you know, ship are still coming in. There are still things coming in. It's not like the border is completely shut down. And, and, and also, you know, we don't manufacture everything abroad, abroad right? So there are, uh, uh, and, and, and from, from a food supply standpoint, America is quite self-sufficient, self right? We, we do produce a lot of what we consume here locally. Right. I think what we are referring to the global supply chain is really manufacturing, right? A lot of the ma manufacturing have gone abroad, right? Clothing. I mean, are we caring more? Are we thinking much about clothing right now, right? No, this is not really the number one priority in our mind. What, what the number one priority is really, what are we going to eat, right? Uh, what, what, uh, how do we protect ourselves? And, and when you see, we, we actually struggle a lot for a long time being able to, to supply mask, face mask, right? So, so those are, th those are the, um, the, um, the shortages that, 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 way we were filled, that we were faced with, right? Everything that is manufacturing related, right? You saw a lot of the shortage, shortages. Uh, the, um, all the, the, the healthcare equipment, we, didn't, we couldn't manufacture those here. Now we are catching up. But I, th I think on the manufacturing side, yeah, there was a lot of uh, supply sh shortages. But on the bare necessities, a lot of food related, I think we, uh, we didn't have much issues there. So I got a question from an international trade attorney on this issue who um, was talking about what if we had shorter, more resilient supply chains with an element of duplication built into that? Is that something you think we should have that you favor, even though things might cost more if you if you double up. Would you be willing to to pay twenty percent more? No. Right. So I no. mean, this, this is a very competitive economy, right? Right. It's a very competitive economy, and and I think uh, uh, yes, we are going to think about oh yes, let's bring everything in house. But when when uh, we are going to uh, are we going to close the border from products coming from China? I don't think so. I think ultimately this is a very open economy. This is an open country. I think um, we are not going to shut down the border. That's for sure. I think what companies are going to do, they are going to rethink their supply chain, right? Because these have been very, very disruptive. 
even before COVID-19, companies were already starting to think about what if, right? The investors, right. the investors were pushing companies to think about risk management. And, and this is where, when we are talking about environmental climate change, overall, what, we to, what we're referring to ESG factors, there's a lot of, the, of conversation around that going on. Mm -hmm. Right where investors are pushing companies to to think around the risk they are exposing themselves to, and supply chain is such a major risk, right? So nobody can forecast a pandemic, but you have to be ready for it. And nobody was ready from a supply chain standpoint because we are all depending on China. So what you are going to see most likely companies do, they are going to find alternative not necessarily in the United States, but around and outside of China. So I think that creates more opportunities for, the, for other developing countries. Which might open up some opportunities for entirely different businesses, right? Absolutely. That's a different business model going around <laughs> where and, and, it used and, to go through. And, and, and that's where I get- kind of, It's kind of hard to see the positives. You know, I, I, you know we, we, we see all the negatives that has come out of this. But right. there are some positives that are coming out of this to Victor's points before and and people just learning how to live with less. And there's there's just a lot of positives that are coming out of this as well, too. I always like try to be an optimist as best I possibly can. It's hard to be optimistic in this in this environment. But I, I think we have to think of some of the, the positive aspects of you know what's coming out of this as well, too, particularly the supply chain moving forward with manufacturing and things of that sort. Um, I have a question from... Uh, our colleague, Mike Zerilli, what are the tax implications of withdrawing from a 401k? Are there any problems that you know of regarding delays with people's New York State tax refund? Um, so withdrawing from a 401k, um, you know, uh, I get the question sometimes if you're laid off, you know, should you take money from your 401k? And, um, you know, certainly I would be tapping my, you know, any other savings that I have or depleting any other savings or maybe not depleting all the savings, but some of those savings before you go into your 401k. So at this point in time, um, well, let, let me backtrack for a second. Normally, um, if you were to take an early withdrawal out of your 401k, that's if you're, you know, um, less than 59 and a half years old is when you're able to take money out uh, without any kind of penalty. But previously, if you took an early withdrawal, then you have to pay a 10% penalty and you also have to pay tax on that withdrawal. The CARES Act, however, provides for withdrawals of up to $100,000 for eligible persons. You know, someone who's lost their job, has experienced financial, financial distress, needs the money, um, and, they, and it doesn't have to be repaid. Um, uh, uh, but if you repay that money back within three years, then you can claim a refund for the taxes that you actually um, had to pay on that 401k withdrawal. So right now, again, you're getting some relief um, from these penalties and things like that if you need to tap into these monies uh, at this point. So you can take it out and you don't have to pay a penalty on not it? Not right now, you do not have to pay a penalty. You will have to pay tax on it, obviously, but not the 10% penalty. But again, if you pay back that money to your 401k within three years, you'll get a tax refund for the taxes that you paid. Um, and, and so if you're looking at different pots of money that you're going to dip into, is there one that's smarter than another? Like I said before, Edie, you know, if you have, you know, any type of other savings, um, I, I would definitely look uh, towards, you know, looking at other savings before, you know, you look to tapping into the 401k. Some people that's not possible and that's all they have and they have to do that. Um, the other thing you might look to do, too, is you can take a loan against your 401k as well, too, instead of actually withdrawing the money out. Um, and then uh, if you think you're going to stay with your employer for quite, you know, for some time, you've been there for a while, there's no reason to believe you're not going to be let go, then you have five years to pay back that loan as well, too. So um, maybe take a loan before you actually take out a withdrawal. Um, but, you know, if you're severed from your employer now, right, and all you have is that pot of 401k, that might be your option. Um, let me ask you another um, layoff question. So many people were laid off right away, right? They, they just uh, were gone within days of the economy shutting down. But I've also read that, you know, this may come back in like two, three months when companies really get a sense of 
their financial health, if not even over the long term, over the next six months or a year, are we going to see more layoffs, do you think? Um, well, um, I don't want you to have to, by the way, I feel like you have to look at a crystal ball. I really yeah, don't. I, I'm just wondering. I, I, right. I, I, I don't, I wish I had the crystal ball to, to be able to tell you that, but um, I think it's, it's going to be um, an unfortunate um, uh, result <laughs> uh, that if the economy continues the way it is and we don't get back, you know, in, in, into, into working and getting things working again, unfortunately, I, I just think that's going to be an unfortunate, you know, outcome of, of this and there will be more layoffs. But I also think that if that happens, I mean, already Congress is talking about another round of money coming right. and putting money in, in people's pockets again, because the first round just isn't enough to get people by. So I would have to think that there's going to be either some extension on the unemployment benefits, some more money coming out to the general public. Again, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine uh, that, you know, people could go on for six months without having any money. It, 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 we would be in, 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 forget about the Great Depression, right? We'd be <laughs> in, in a much worse situation. Right. Victor, okay. I didn't get right. to, I mean, uh, let me right. ask you too, how long can we go on like this? We don't know. I think, I think that's the uncertainty that, is, that has been rattling everybody, right? Um, I, I think, you know, we can just be hopeful. We can just be hopeful that some of the signal coming out there from a, you know, some vaccine potentially coming out very, very quicker, quicker than was anticipated, you know, that, that could help. And, you know, maybe slowly easing and protecting ourselves uh, and keeping social distancing. You know, I, I think the, the economy definitely cannot just keep going this way. It's, it, it will be a, a calamity. Um, I think what, you know, unfortunately, there will be uh, companies that are not going to survive this, right? Right. Uh, that's just a reality. Uh, I, I think what, but the stimulus that is coming out is really good and it's really unprecedented. This is a lot of money being thrown out in the system. And I really think that, you know, if we address the health crisis, if this is addressed by September, I think the recovery is going to be very, very strong. Um, I, I really think so. And that's why I always say, keep saying, health first. Let's address this health crisis quickly. Let's get a solution very, very quickly on how people can feel comfortable about continuing with their, with, with their life. This is who we are. Human beings protect themselves. Right? People are not going to go out there and put their, their life uh, in arms in arms land, in, in arms way. Right? They are going to protect themselves first. And once they have that clarity, they will they will come back out in force. Edie is you know, one thing to Victor's point as well, too, uh, under the Payroll Protection Act, which is where small businesses are, are basically getting their monies right now. I mean, uh, clearly in the first round that came out. Uh, it was depleted. Uh, but the government is now putting out more money for small businesses as well, too, so that those businesses who didn't get it in the first round might be able to get it in the second round as well, too. So there is, to Victor's point, more money being put out into the economy, particularly for the small businesses to help them. Um, if you are, the, I'm, I'm looking at more of the individual questions now, Denise, that we got. Um, and back on the subject of credit cards, so you get this stimulus check and you're going to try to keep yourself afloat. Should you just be paying the minimum amount due on your credit cards? Yeah, if you can pay the minimum amount on your credit card, I, I, would, I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, if that's not, if you're not able to do that, like I said before, contact your, your, your creditor. And again, they, they are giving relief to, to customers and understanding the situation we're in. Is there a central place that people can go to find out whether, how, what their particular credit, like is there a central place where you can know how all the big major credit cards are handling this? No, actually, I, I think what you can do is just go right to the website of your creditor. So if you have your credit card with Chase or Citibank or whatever it is, go right to their website. They have, they have, they have this is all posted up on their web, websites. It's very, very easy to find. Um, you know, and, and that's probably the best way to, to get to them. It might get a, take a little time to get through, um, but, but keep trying to get through and, uh, and, and they'll work with you. Victor, you said you weren't so worried about the U.S. I'm, I'm interested, although you've sort of answered the question as to why you're not, but if not us, who's going to really get slammed by this? I think, uh, you know, 
that's why again having the dollar right a, a, a reserve currency and 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 about what the us is represent as a country i mean why is the US, why is the dollar so powerful because the the world is burning and when the world is burning where do investors go they come to the us because they they trust the system that is in place here and what is the system that we have it's actually a system where you know, um, you are you are free. You are. We, when I was having this conversation with my student. I asked them that question. The first thing that they said is freedom, because people can do what they want. The uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship here, and and the the system, the balance of power, and people are trusting it because they see that this, such a system is not likely to collapse. It's not tomorrow we are going to see a, a collapse in government power here in the United States. Other, other places, that's the case. Look at the European Union. The European Union com cannot come together with, for a stimulus package for their own population. Whereas their economy com combined is larger than the US. But the Euro, uh, the, the European governments have not been able to muster a response that is actually require for this type of crisis. Why? Because, you know, Germany and, and the Netherlands, right, they don't like that. So they are in this doctrinal, doctrinal blockade, which is actually, unfortunately, uh, to the detriment of the European Union. I think they should be coming out with, with a stimulus package equivalent to what we are doing here. And then on the other end, you know, and again, I'm, I'm looking at the, the rivals, right, for the United States. On the other end, look at China. I mean, my question is always, I mean, can we trust the Chinese system? I mean, is, is China open enough? I, unfortunately, China is not an open society. And that's, that's to their detriment. And, and that's where their government is making a huge mistake. They are, they are aspiring to become a global leader, but unfortunately, in an open so it, with, uh, with the system that they have right now, nobody can trust them really seriously. So I think, I think that's where, again, when you look back, I mean, this is what investors think. Where am I going to park my money, right? The US is the only place that really is, um, is, is, uh, is capable of doing that. And, and therefore, we hope that the recovery in the US can come very, very quickly. And, there, and, then, the, the, and then the US also can lead the world, right, out of this. Historically, the US has done that. And this is the first time that the U.S. leadership is it's is lacking and it's unfortunate. Um, you were talking about talking to your students. I'm interested just for both of you. You have this living history happening right now, and you're both teaching, right? Yeah. So how are you incorporating the events of the world into your classrooms? I mean, this is what we are talking about actually all the time, right? I, I push them to think about uh, globalization. We're talking about supply chain. We, I, was, I was actually encouraging them, you know, hey, don't let this, uh, you know, preclude you from thinking international. Your future, you know, you are young. This is the time for you to understand what other countries are doing. Because I think uh, maybe your future would be in helping an American company uh, establish itself in another country tomorrow. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant here. I came here. I, I, I think that the, the world has so much to offer to the U.S., uh, and it will be unfortunate for this young generation not to understand better the world. Right. How about you, Denise? Get your CPA as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> because, and I say this because the accounting profession in many regards is almost recession-proof, right? Right now, people need to have their taxes done. They need advice on all these taxes. So if you're in tax, you're busy and you're, you're, you're not slowing down right now. Um, you know, I'm an academic teaching accounting, you know, <laughs> things are going, you know, fairly well right now. Um, and, you know, even a, a lot of my colleagues that are in accounting positions, uh, you know, with just with, with, the, with the financial crisis and things that are going on, um, you know, they, they're still relatively busy as well too. So um, I always say accounting is somewhat of a re recession proof, uh, you know, career. You're in the right career, get certified as soon as possible. Do you have um, students who are seniors who are now looking at uh, graduating without a job? 
No, actually, in accounting, um, uh, the big accounting firms right now are still recruiting. Uh, we've got students who've been offered, you know, jobs at EY and KPMG, and they are still actively recruiting, and they're moving forward. That you know, as if things are things are going to move forward. Maybe their their start time will be pushed out a little bit, but they're still actively recruiting, um, you know, uh, you know, candidates and and students uh, for jobs within the firms. Um, Victor, you think we're looking at a world where um, we've hit a point of no return in terms of how much work gets done at home? Uh, no, because human beings don't like to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the proof. I'm really I mean, maxing out on Zoom. I don't know what that tells you. But, I mean, <laughs> I mean we, we were thinking about that technology is going to completely disrupt uh, human relationship. And ultimately, we are finding that human relationship cannot, humans cannot stay away from each other. So I think, I think um, uh, you know, there is a place for technology, right? There is a place for technology, I, I think. But uh, nothing can replace, uh, you know, our interaction with each other. I do think, though, that it's forcing companies to, to rethink you know, what positions are conducive to maybe, you know, more work-life balance and, you know, being able to work from home versus in the office and, and those types of things. And I think companies are going to be looking at that a little bit more closely now that we've seen that a lot of positions that, you know, we thought we had to be in the office and be together. And I, I, I agree with Victor. I, I want to be out with people myself, too. I mean, I'm an academic, right? I, I love to be in the classroom with students, right? But I think corporations and companies are going to start rethinking, you know, how they can manage the workforce in the workplace relative to being able to work, you know, offsite and, and work in the office. No, and, um, and, and absolutely, yes, it, don't get me wrong. I think that it's, it's a very important part of, of the workforce. And, and that speaks to uh, another point that I think I put together some slides and, and where, you know, the demographics, the demographic issue uh, we need to address, and particularly uh, natality issues, right? How, how do we encourage, be, how are we more flexible with parents? Let me just get to that slide, Victor. Yeah. Is it this one or the, or the uh, well, this so, is about that, that we should not worry about the national debt. No, absolutely. For, for this one, I, I, I was really saying here that uh, the, uh, not national debt, uh, yes, it's worrisome, but this is not the time to think about it. I think this is the time first we, we need to stabilize the economy and we are, going to wrap, we are going to rack up some more debt, but it's a temporary issue. And if you move, if you move to, the, to uh, slide number seven, mm -hmm. this is really beyond the COVID-19. This is the, the structural crisis that we are faced with. We are not making enough children. Down the road, this is going to come and bite us back because these are the future. These are the kids who are going to support the baby boomers, right? We are having crisis with social security, but who is going to be able to support their, their retirement? We, people are living longer but we are not having enough kids. That's a pretty steep drop, isn't it? It's, it's a major drop. But what is driving that drop is because of the financial crisis since 2007, right? Because one, it's more expensive to raise a family. So obviously women are waiting longer to have, to have kids because it's too expensive. So we have to address these social issues. That's, that's, the, that's the argument that, that, that I'm making which actually uh, address some of that question that you asked, right? We have to accommodate our workforce and particularly those who are parents, mm -hmm. right? If it's not enough, we are not, we are not, um, um, uh, we are not providing enough flexibility uh, for, to parents uh, to raise their kids and at the same time work from home. Mm -hmm. but, let me get to your uh, last slide here, which both of you can, this is sort of strategic considerations and how we should look forward about this. Yeah. You wanna start, Victor, what are your thoughts about all of this? My, my, uh, in, in, the, in the previous slide, I said, our, our financial crisis is due to what I call the trilogy of tax cuts. Mm -hmm. It was a major mistake. Unfortunately, a politician comes 
with what we call, I remember, uh, uh, Bush father call it, call, called it voodoo economics. <laughs> right? I mean, you cannot cut taxes and hope that, you know, you are going to balance the budget. It doesn't work that way, right? So I think we have some structural issues that we need to address. We will have to pay more taxes, unfortunately. And the president who is going to raise taxes, I'm sure he's going to only have one term. But he has to be willing to do that. The country has to come back to fiscal discipline. This is not the time to do it. But down the road, once, once we, rec we recover from this financial, from, from this uh, health crisis and likely economic uh, recession, right, we will, you know, over time, we have to address some of these fiscal issues. And, and those are structural fiscal issues. And right now, our, our, those structural issues are 61% of the federal budget are mandatory, are man, are mandatory spending. Mm -hmm. These are Social Security, uh, Medicare, yeah. uh, Medicaid. All the entitlements, you can, right. You cannot cut that. So you are looking at discretionary spending. What are the discretionary spending? Education, military, those you cannot necessarily cut. So the only way you can address that is by raising taxes, right? We have to be honest with ourselves. Then, how do you really stimulate an economy? You go through government spending, but it has to be smart spending. And the best way to do that is through infrastructure development. We know our roads are not, you know, uh, infrastructure for the 21st century. So we, we, we have, we can, we can become leaders in the new technology. Most Americans innovation are coming from Google, Facebook, um, you know, all, all the fang companies, which other country in the world is as, as innovative as, as in the United States. So you can actually create, continue building this invest infrastructure that allow this type of companies to emerge, right? And that's the, the, the point to I'm, I'm making here. And also we have to be bold on social issues, right? Education number one, it's very expensive for kids today to have a, a quality education. I think those are the priorities that we have to look at when we are looking at um, uh, some of these uh, tax policies. Education, addressing these demographics, structural issues that I pointed earlier, where we are not making enough kids because it's just too expensive to have kids. So therefore you have to come up with solutions and also provide flexibilities for parents to build families. It's too expensive to have families today, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's great to have girls who are actually pursuing their education, it's great. But then they are going to have jobs and then they have to build their career but therefore, when they want to actually stay home and take care of the kids, it's very difficult for them to come back to the workforce. It needs to be addressed. Other Western countries are doing better than us are doing. Income inequality, this is, it cannot continue. It's not sustainable. We have too much poverty. There are pockets of poverty in the United States, which is actually very embarrassing. And we are ignoring it, right? It cannot continue. The poverty in the United States is not a race issue. You have poverty across the board, both white, Hispanic, and blacks. Mm -hmm. We need to address that. And therefore, and also the US has to be bold. China is the rival, right? It's not an enemy. China is making inroads in Africa. America, looking up to the future, America needs to be engaged more on that continent because it's a very, very resourceful continent. 60% of Africans are below the age of 18. That's where the workforce, the manufacturing hub of the world in the next 20 years will be coming from. Right? And when we are talking about supply chain, diversifying supply chain, this is where companies should be looking into. Mm -hmm. Denise, you want to jump in on this in terms of, uh, and then I'm going to get to a couple other questions that have come in. But this was a terrific summary. I got to give kudos to, to Victor with this one. This is, I, I couldn't have said it better, um, but I agree with him on the tax policy. Uh, we have to do something. What, what, what just transpired, you know, under the current administration 
was not a tax reform like we saw in 1986 under Reagan, right? Mm -hmm. um, we need a severe tax reform in the United States in order to do a lot of these things that Victor has proposed on this slide. Um, and getting to social, uh, you know, social security is very dear to my heart, right? You know, uh, the elderly folks, um, they don't have to worry too much about social security right now. But when, you know, folks in, in my age group are going to retire, right now the prediction is that, or, or the estimate is that social security will be completely depleted by 2035. We will not have any more money in social security. Um, and, and, and when you talk about people that are in low, in, you know, the, the income inequality, a lot of people depend on their social security check. And to, to, we, we have to be able to replenish social security. And we're not going to do that without looking at, you know, severe tax reform uh, in this country or a, any of the things that Victor was talking about. Um, all right. We have a question from Katie Coppinger. And Katie, I'm going to unmute you right there and let you ask it, if I can unmute you, by the way or if Esther or Devante, someone could unmute her, um, because I want to make sure that I ask it properly. Go ahead. Well, as you can imagine, I'm not used to being muted. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is a, a great, great discussion. I appreciate it, and appreciate both of you guys being here with us. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, obviously with this huge increased debt from the federal stimulation, um, and, and what you're and picking up on your point, Victor, too, that we obvious and social security and all the needs we have. How I'm trying to envision, I mean, how are we going to pay off this debt and do what we need to do? Um, and how do you guys see this affecting uh, the personal economics of people? I mean, how, how we're going to be able to sustain this? What, what are your, I'm sure you guys have been thinking about this because I know I have. I mean, we all ultimately pay for these things. We all do. But um, how do you guys see this actually playing out? If, if I can start, Edie, if Edie, would you mind showing one of my slides? Can you Not at all. Document? Not at all, Victor, which one? So if you put up uh, the chart with um, uh, the forecast, right? So Got it. if you look at where we are, Edie, um, uh, Katie, yeah. most likely a debt to GDP ratio is going to be most likely surpassing the level of the post-war war II, right? This is gonna be temporary. We are racking up debt, but it's not going to be debt forever, right? We, we are, I mean, the country is spending primarily to, to, stop, to stop the cliff. And obviously this is what in economics we, we, we call automatic stabilizer because it's going to look bad because nobody is paying taxes and because people don't have jobs so money is not coming in and then the government is spending further but if the economy does not recover quickly therefore that crisis actually can be even longer so once the economy recover and if the recovery is robust enough therefore you start uh, increasing more revenue and therefore you can pay back the debt. One of the good things that's going on now is that we are in a very low interest rate environment. If you can go to uh, slide number six, ED, right? We are borrowing, but at a very cheap rate, right? The, the, 30, the, 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 uh, the 10 year uh, yield, it's, it's near zero, right? That this is unprecedented level of, of interest rate. So the government right now interest cost is about two percent of spending, right? So the government can can borrow. What what will be dangerous is when we start seeing those interest rates start to rise, which is not the case yet because of the the, the globalization and the competitive nature of of our economy and people just are parking their money here in the United States, which is keeping our interest rate also low, right? So, so, so that's, um, I, I think that if we are disciplined enough, once this financial crisis, we are off this financial crisis and we are disciplined enough, that that would not be an issue. And, and, and again, that's why I am referring to the structural issues. We should not give tax cut, unnecessary tax cut. It was a major mistake, the 2007 
was a tax cut was a major mistake. Actually, that's what one of those tax cuts led to what where we are right now, right? Where we we are actually were on sugar high, right? Mm -hmm. We were, we had a bubble and the bubble burst, right? Why? Because of this fiscal policies that actually are not timely done. Right. Denise, any final thoughts from you? We're gonna we're uh, very close to the end of our hour, unfortunately. No, actually, I this was you know a perfect uh, segue into the end and uh, and to Katie's question. Um, I can't agree with Victor anymore in in the comments that he made. Definitely, we we have to do something with tax policy to address this, and we will, and and we will get out of this. It's going to take time. But, but we, will, we, we, we will get back on track. Okay, thank you both. Listen, if any of you have any further questions, by the way, please send them to us and we will forward them on to um, uh, Victor Patenkamani and Denise Stefano uh, to get answered. And if we discover that there are any major resources that you all should have, if you have further questions about your finances, that makes sense to put out there, we'll put them on a graphic and we will be, this will be able to be replayed um, very soon. So um, I wanna thank you all for joining us. And um, Victor, Denise, thank you so much for lots of information. And by the way, thank you for ending on a positive note, not for nothing. <laughs> I'd like to feel a little optimistic. Yes. All right, take care everyone. Thank you everyone, thank goodbye you. now. Bye-bye.